well. Uh, this time, it's the first time that Libex is organizing it as a local partner in cooperation with Austin Economic Center and with support from the Global Nonprofit Trust and the Liberty Fund, which have been very important actors in, in uh, supporting the libertarian movement around the world. This time on the Free Market Growth Show, we are discussing three very relevant questions for the, for the present time in this country and in the world as well. The first panel will deal with the problems of the, of, of the current economic crisis in Europe and the question how much Europe we can afford, especially relevant for, for Serbia, which is now accelerating its, its efforts towards the European integration. So let's see, let's see how that works and what, what are the arguments for and against and what are the possible challenges as well for our members and for other countries. Uh, second panel uh, deals with recovery, but the, the econo economic recovery and uh, bringing the economy back on track. Let's see what, whether the government intervention can lead to the economic recovery or is it something else that, that, that's, that's more important. Third panel will deal with the question of youth unemployment and what can be done. Uh, in order to deal with the new path of employment. Uh, the lectures come from, from various institutions around the world, and you will get to know the through their presentations. Uh, right now, I'll just say that on the count of Lebeck, we are very happy that we can organize this in Serbia. And my free market brochure, my first free market brochure uh, was uh, in, right in this room in 2010, and I was just in the attendance of one of the first libertarian events I attended. And now we are organizing it, so it's kind of cool. Um, but right now, I'm going to give the floor to the vice dean of the Faculty of Economics, who is in charge for international, international cooperation, uh, Mikhail Alandereko, uh, who is going to, to welcome you to, to, to this institution and to the event. And after that, uh, we will proceed to the first panel, which will be chaired by Mikhail uh, Guys, <laughs> our economist from Lindbeck and also uh, economic analyst for the Political Accountability Network and of course a uh, uh, blogger at the Tool Fund Island blog, uh, which is one of the, the best blogs on the economics in, in Serbia. Uh, Professor Andrenko will now address you and thank you for coming. I welcome you all for coming here. I have the honor and the privilege to open this, really, really open and start this discussion. So the first panel is called How Much Europe Can We Really Afford? 
Uh, keynote speaker is Mr. Gordon Kerr, one of the founders of the Cobden Partners and think tech organization, private one, uh, which guides and consults the governments uh, who are willing to improve their regulation in the banking sector. Uh, he's probably most famous for his role in the hmm, securing the uh, Swedish bank system in 1992 when a lot of Swedish banks actually went bankrupt and were bailouted by the state. Uh, he will talk about the bank sector in the European Union and wha uh, what are the regulations which have some, let's say, fraudulent, fraudulent incentives in it. Second speaker is, is Mr. Marko Malovic from the Institute of Economic Sciences in Belgrade. He is also a lecturer at the University of Donja Gorica in Montenegro. He, he will most uh, notably ac uh, access the prices of the European Union for the people living in it. And the third speaker is Pauli Mihailovic from the Club von Neumann and Libek and Political Accountability Network, etc. He is most uh, famous for his uh, treatise on the uh, fixed exchange regime for the Serbian currency, uh, written this, this year. So I give floor for everybody. Mr. Kerr, please. Professor, fellow panelists, uh, Mikhail, thank you very much for inviting me here today. Um, just one tiny correction to the introduction. I'm not actually a think tank person. Cotton Partners is, is a business, it's fairly unique. I think I'm a lunatic because we are the only business I think on the planet that's trying to fix the banking crisis for various governments. So for two years now we've been travelling around just talking to various <coughs> entities about it, central banks, opposition parties from uh, Iceland to South America. Um, I was invited to give this presentation on May the 8th of the European Parliament when some uh, members finally worked out that what we've been saying is true, that the banking system is completely broken and they've completely captured the rule makers. <coughs> the problem with banks is a complete lack of accountability and it starts with the very word accounting and the accounting rules. I won't go through this because we don't have time and it will bore you because this is more of a kind of educational forum, but the presentation was entitled How Banks Actually Get Away by Falsifying Their Accounts. The big banks are acting exactly the same as the American fraudster Bernie Madoff. You've heard of him? How, how this chap basically took $65 billion from investors and splurged it more or less on himself and his family. This is how banking works and this is how they do it. This transaction shocked the 130 accountants in the room in the, in the Brussels Parliament on May the 8th. They were fairly senior people. They'd come to try to defend the, the, game, the, the, the nonsensical rules that they have established uh, and have been approved by the European Parliament and obviously I'm lobbying the Parliament to change these rules and ideally use my firm to do so. This is a structure done in 2010, well after the banks had collapsed by a major failed UK bank and the whole point was to avoid booking any losses on a failed portfolio of loans. These are just modern banking instruments, two special purpose vehicles, SPV1, an English trust structure, deviating cash flows, the two transactions are unrelated. The first one enables three quarters of the funding on this 10 billion portfolio to be procured from UK taxpayers via a cheap Bank of England loan. The second transaction really was the icing on the cake where these modern transactions called credit default swaps, which I'll talk about a bit later, one is set up as an entirely circular transaction. No economic activity at all, but merely arranging this tr second transaction, writing an insurance policy on the first 5% of the portfolio to default, enables these two wonderful outcomes. So in addition, the first outcome is not booking any losses, and the second one is creating fake capital of a third of a billion pounds. So under these insane Basel rules, the next day after this transaction, the bank appears to be far more solvent than it really was. So you see the banks are motivated to do this sort of thing. They're not motivated to make loans to small companies or cafes or whatever. I turn now, if I may, to this famous JP Morgan whale trade. I wonder if news of that has reached, <laughs> reached uh, uh, Belgrade. Have you heard about this JP Morgan trade? It's one of the most kind of famous instances of, uh, of um, bank activity since the crisis and the American bailouts and it's led to an 80 page report 
which you can download from the website by JP Morgan, and a US congressional inquiry, which may have cost more than the losses of the trade itself. Because we all get confused by big numbers, I've put some numbers and the diagram on the board here. I think the total losses were $6 billion from a straightforward piece of gambling. $6 billion is three times the UK annual gross domestic product. The bank have lied throughout the investigation and constantly claimed that the trade was a hedge. But even the kind of famous 1970s detective Columbo could have worked out that that was a false statement. It's clearly just a gamble. The initial false statement was up. Oh, we're a bank, therefore we make loans. So we want to sell short an index of loans. They call it a credit index basket. Sell short the index so we'll hedge our loans. Just pause for a second. Do you know any bank in your country that thinks, because we're making loans, I have to hedge the loans by selling the index short? So step one, I dare not move in case my Macbeth eye falls out. But step one uh, shows a, a huge five-year short position booked in about 2009. That was the original bet, or they said hedge. Um, the problem with selling anything short in any bank trading room is it's very expensive. And if you don't get the market timing right, you know, it costs you a great deal of cash very quickly. Furthermore, the size of this bet was so large, obviously it moved the market. There's not a huge deep market in five year short positions in credit index baskets. And they rapidly built up such a large position because most of these traders that bring their banks down are convinced that they're gods. They are masters of the universe. The market must be wrong, so they kept loading up and loading up like a, like a gambler in a Las Vegas casino with my colleagues at the back. Uh, second stage was in uh, 2010, a year later, when management realized that things were going wrong and asked them to try to lock out, try to offset some of this exposure. And here they chose to put on a, a long position in the 10-year, which obviously is not a perfect hedge to the short position in the five-year, which had now become three years. Um, 2012, I got a call one morning at five in the morning from Bloomberg Television to, to run into the studios or take a taxi or something at 7 a.m. because overnight it had all blown up. The, Jamie Demon, the chief executive, said this trade was being closed out. They would lose $2 billion. It took them the whole year and the losses were three times that amount. And of course the problem was that by 2012 the short position had virtually expired. I've simplified everything, you know, some of it was still outstanding. And of course the rest of the market was just sitting there. Everybody knew that JP Morgan had this problem. And so what do you think the other traders did? They just refused to sell the position that JP Morgan wanted to buy. So of course the price constantly moved against JP Morgan. That's why the losses were so great. In addition to this mismatch, in the five-year, ten-year position, they'd also, there were also other details. The, the short position was in uh, uh, high investment grade. The long position was in uh, junk bonds and so forth. Every aspect of this gamble, the bank got wrong. But of course, the bankers are gambling not with their own money, but with yours and mine, because we bail them out. So we have this term in, in the London markets, opium. I don't know if it translates very well, the heady mix of opium, or coke, to which people are addicted, but opium, the letters are OPM, other people's money. So my message to you students is, this system will completely collapse. There is absolutely no chance that these banks who are falsifying their accounts in this way, only, only showing more capital, only marking up positions to try to create fake profits, engaging in, in Gambles like this, which are three times the size of the UK economy, purely as, a, purely as a gamble and claiming afterwards dishonestly it was a hedge. This kind of activity is the absolute rock bottom of the immorality of the broken banking system. In the Brussels Parliament, I was amazed on May the 8th because I was lucky enough to be the last speaker. I followed Francine Flores, who is the chief executive of the body that writes into law the European accounting rules for banks. And her message was, don't worry, members of parliament, everything's fine. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. 130 people had flown in from Germany, Austria, from the UK, and so forth. And I, I delivered this presentation here, and I talked about that there. Nobody talked to me afterwards. 
Obviously, the system still works. Obviously, these banks continue to have everybody captured. They have governments and other people by very, very delicate underbelly and soft parts. So I was asked yesterday by some young student, you know, what should she do in this market? How can she become an entrepreneur? Well, I said to her, as I said to you, go and get a job in a big bank. Royal Bank of Scotland are paying starting salaries to graduates of 100,000 euros a year. It is the most failed bank I have ever come across. It makes JP Morgan look like Mother Teresa. I, I, I wrote a little, a little book, long paper, which is on, on our Cotton Partners website, uh, The Law of Opposites. And this details how I, you know, my firm was the first entity to write the RBS in 2011, falsified their accounts by 24 billion pounds. That's two times the cost of the London Olympics. Their motivation is purely to keep their salaries and all bonuses going. Everybody wants a Ferrari or a Stradivarius violin. My goodness me, leaving your economy in the hands of these bankers is like leaving a Stradivarius violin in the hands of a gorilla. So don't trust a word these guys say. Believe me, they can come up with the most wonderful, fancy, slick arguments, but this system is completely broken. The regulators and politicians that I speak to don't really like to listen. They try to swerve around. Nobody wants to be first to break away. But I'm confident the Cotton Partners will have some success because at some point people are going to realise they need a plan B. And unless this banking system is fixed and rules are changed, it will bring down current. I think I've probably exceeded my time, so thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, my speech today and presentation is going to be on how much Europe we can afford, uh, and uh, hopefully by the end of my presentation, it's going to be a tiny bit clearer why, if it is not broken, uh, this uh, fixing this mess could still be a, a, a pretty good idea. Once a champion of the unified currency gospel, uh, EMU is today lingering at the verge of a breakup. What are the fundamental reasons for this sequential too little, too, li too late and in the wrong direction approach to the Eurozone crisis? Uh, I think it's fair to say that uh, if we are to keep the European Monetary Union in its current magnitude, shape and form, some degree of budgetary coordination is necessary for smooth operation of the currency union. Uh, even more so since it is rather obvious that EMU is not an optimum currency area. Now EMU's core is trying to dismiss or minimize cross subsidization on moral hazard grounds, which is to the extent a legitimate concern while EMU periphery is trying to delay or avoid altogether necessary reforms and maximize the transfer size from the core. Uh, this all gives rise to multiplicity of equilibria, uh, only what, one of which entails the survival of the EMU in this present form, if indeed that is uh, a first best solution. Uh, External environment is obviously not nice for a number of years now. We've got structural public debt crisis on a global scale on the top of uh, bailing in the banks, which was, in my opinion, the straw which broke the camel's back. Uh, and uh, back in 2011 from 2001, we've got uh, $20 trillion worth of government bonds outstanding and rising. Uh, Apart from US Treasury bills and German bonds, there's nowhere to run if you're not willing to, to take some risk. Uh, 
So Tinder may have initially come from the US, but contrary to Mr. Barroso and the Commission, the crisis in EMU is in fact the crisis of EMU, after all. Uh, we've got several layers of uh, crisis. First is political gridlock and the crisis of trust. So uh, we've got lack of trust between the Eurozone and the European Union, between Britain and continental Europe, between Schengen zone and non Schengen zone, between the periphery and the core, between Germany and everyone else, quite frankly, etc. Uh, uh, also, we've got sovereign debt crisis uh, and speculative pressures by the global financial market. We've got sovereigns which were bailed in into rescue of banksters, quite frankly, and which you could have gathered from uh, the speech of my honorable colleague which spoke bef before me. And obviously, we've got currency crisis stemming from constructional flaws of the euro as well as from the crisis of trust itself. Uh, finally, we've got, but not least, imminent banking crisis at the Eurozone's core and full-blown banking crisis at the Eurozone's periphery. Uh, now, in terms of uh, international banking crisis which unraveled at the European continent, I'm going to say just a few points. Greek debt swap, which was in fact the largest orderly bailout uh, and, uh, and, and breathtaking arrogance on behalf of, of the Eurozone's leaders, uh, had nothing to do with public sector involvement. It was in fact uh, 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 private sector involvement. Sorry, it was in fact public sector involvement. Then two outros by the ECB uh, were also read by banks as a consequence of such bailouts as an encouragement not to de leverage too much too soon. Uh, EFSF, which is now European Stability Mechanism, was initially meant to bail out banks rather than Eurozone's crisis-stricken sovereigns. And as a result, European banks raised uh, quite expectedly relatively little capital as a buffer against losses much of which was window dressing, if we are to be sincere, rather than true loss absorbing equity. Now notwithstanding the fact that it's increasingly uncomfortable that banks are nationally supervised while they expand their balance sheets as well as risk taking internationally, there's neither money nor political will for mutualization of entire bank debt uh, and expected losses. That would be socially unjust, uh, that would distort resource allocation and would be internationally unfair as well. Uh, on the top of it, there's, there's no political willingness even to provide pan-European deposit protection scheme uh, after which we could and should uh, 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 let those banksters go bust, really and decrease the sovereign debt problems uh, that, we, that we made instead. Uh, once again, it is typically much more expensive to support and bail out banks than sovereigns. So it seems that that story uh, which I told the other day by Rudy Dornbusch, who, who was talking about Latin American crisis and corrupt societies over there, could be uh, one hundred percent transposed to, to the European Monetary Union, sadly, and that is that uh, every uh, the, every politician uh, owns a bank, and every bank owns a couple of politicians nowadays. And with them in cahoots, uh, the, the the European taxpayer is the one who's going to ta to to foot the bill. Uh, so, how much Europe can we afford, really? Uh, my answer to that is as much as we can pay for and are prepared to digest. We can have less Europe, and that would mean to probably give up common currency, because it is not true that there is no more Europe without Euro and without monetary union. Remember, do you remember why, or, or at least it was advertised that way, uh, why we embraced the Euro? The key word 
back in the 90s and early 2000s was stability. And Euro brought about anything but stability. We can obviously downsize EMU to a more manageable uh, one or more truly optimum currency areas uh, because uh, today's European Monetary Union is far from being optimum currency area. And in fact, an empirical study which has been done, uh, which, which was recording a uh, economic, social, political dispersion uh, of uh, truly existing as well as uh, hypothetical monetary unions, uh, put uh, European Monetary Union at the very last slot in terms of being optimum currency area. You can take Mundell's, Peter Kennan's, McKinnon's, wh whichever criterion you, you may want to, to pick. So before European Monetary Union, we've got countries beginning with letter M as being more of a monetary union optimum currency area than EMU itself. All countries on Earth at the fifth parallel north latitude, etc. Obviously, we can, we still can have more Europe, but then we need uh, to agree on the fair degree of, of uh, inevitable fiscal federalism, uh, not fully fledged fiscal federalism, because uh, that, uh, that, th that wouldn't be necessary and probably isn't viable either, since, since fiscal policy is the only instrument left at disposal of national governments to fight uh, uh, asymmetric shocks or asymmetric sh spreading of one and the same shock across EMU which is so diverse but some sort of quasi-fiscal transfers uh, probably Eurozone's Brady-like bonds uh, uh, European Banking Union and the like so we can have more Europe as well uh, we can have more Europe without Euro or we can have less Europe but we cannot perpetuate a status quo. So, in terms of less Europe, we indeed face a new kind of impossible trinity, ceteris uh, paribus. So, we cannot have common currency in this current shape, form and magnitude, Germany in the EMU and pigs countries in the EMU at the same time unexpectable and uh, unimaginable as it may seem at this moment one must be laid off and other things equal one impossibility shall happen the sooner the better if you ask me uh, and notwithstanding significant drawbacks and formidable technicalities in execution of any of the ejections option two uh, more Europe uh, in that case, we must swallow more reforms, more deregulation, more unification, and less austerity. But that doesn't mean abolishing austerity altogether, especially in the fiscally uh, uh, problematic uh, European Mediterranean. Issues to address are the twin crisis, simultaneous currency and banking crisis, or alternatively, sovereign debt come banking nemesis, alongside unemployment agony, and still too rigid labour markets uh, which needs more, need more flexibility and dismantling powerful trade unions or uh, too high minimum wages uh, uh, in, in, the, in the Eurozone score. We need political recalibration of the EMU uh, with obviously and inevitably Germany behind the steering wheel uh, but in terms of levels of power and, and antagonism of interests between, say, European Parliament, European Commission and uh, uh, politicians leading national uh, uh, European nations, nation states. Uh, we need to, to, to deal with uh, worryingly rising administrative costs of more Europe uh, to, in 2009, there was only 30,000 uh, bureaucrats employed by the Brussels. Uh, today, we have 56,000, so that is almost a 100% rise in just four years. So there's too much entitlements, too much bureaucracy, too much red tape, too much insane legislation 
in the, in the European Union. In conclusion, European policies towards the Euro Eurozone crisis, or lack thereof, quite frankly, apart from Draghi's OMT as a temporary backstop, have made matters worse. Austerity, depression, unemployment, bankruptcy spiral shall soon enough backfire at Germany herself if nothing is done, and there will be no uh, that many uh, export markets, there will be sunk costs of thus far made credits, there will be crumbling of the EMU as geopolitical instrument to Berlin, etc. So immediately after German elections, therefore, we shall have a showdown of a uh, get-over or game-over type uh, leading either to more EMU or none at all. Thank you very much. I'm more assured about things that I'm going to say. And uh, my topic is more dedicated to the overall topic of this panel, and that is how much Europe, not can we afford, but will we afford? So uh, let me straightforward state the case, what is my hypothesis, what I think shall happen in the next three to five years. We will have more Europe, we'll have more regulation, we will have more bureaucracy, and we will have fiscal federalization. And now I would like to state uh, possible outcomes of current situation and arguments why I think this will be reality. Unfortunately, I must say, because I also uh, state that this situation must be um, somehow managed, uh, I agree that we cannot, state, uh, we cannot sustain status quo, but that is the exactly what is going to happen as a result of political equi equilibrium in the next three to five years. And let me, let me explain why I think so. So what are, the, what are the possible exit options right now currently in current situation in the European Monetary Union? There are two basic outcomes. The first one is disintegration of Monetary Union, which would mean probably that some countries would gather up as a Northern Euro, as a group, let's say Germany, Austria, Netherlands, Estonia, Slovakia, and that's about it. For starters, maybe France, maybe Belgium, doesn't matter that much, but they will stay as a, as a, a smaller group of um, more close to the notion of um, optimal currency area, yet not optimal, but much closer. And that is one outcome. I don't think it's, it's uh, plausible uh, because of uh, following things. Expenses, political expenses for every particular country and political leaders in that country right now are too high to exit Euro or destroy Euro in any way. So the other option, which I think is much more possible, is fiscal federalization, which would mean following things. The first one is having Euro bonds. That's for sure going to go in after next German election. I'm definitely sure about it because there is no way to gather funds from the bailout banks anymore through sovereign states, they don't like risk, even though there is not much risk if you just print out the money in, in uh, ECB. So what they want, they want that Germany backs the European bonds and uh, they had a wider pool, so that's one thing that's going to, to be imposed really, really soon. The second thing is I think there will be systematic income tax overall in the whole Europe probably progressive income tax that will finance transfers from the center to periphery. And those transfers, if you want to go to fiscal federalization, and I think politicians want to go there, have to be, let's say, 5% of GDP from Germany has to go to Greece. It will be really, really hard political sell, but it will be sold. Because all politicians in European Union today are in the same bed with bankers, with themselves, between each other. They have, to be, they have to be together on this, and they will push it, especially if Angela Merkel wins next German elections. It will go much faster. In spite of her personal um, dislike of fiscal federalization, I must say. The next thing what will happen with fiscal federalization is it will go without Great Britain. And the next thing is that um, the level of taxation 
and um, let's say income regulation, so all the taxes, regulation about business, uh, um, property tax, those kind of things, will go up more progressive to the level, let's say, of France. So the fiscal federalization will be like everybody gets the similar rules, but those rules can be either in level of Estonia or in level of, let's say, France, Denmark or something like that. And I think that reality will be to go more toward France because that is current political reality. Right parties lost their um, race in recent events. I think that the left will bring together France is the, the last uh, country that sustained a shift in the political spectrum. So I think that is the reality. Now let's go to the arguments why I think this will happen. The first thing is this monetary union is not the precedent in means of there, if there is a monetary union. There were many monetary unions. Let's say there was a Scandinavian union, there was Latin union, there were, of course, United States of America have monetary union between the states. Um, also, there was a monetary union of German countries. But what is precedent right now is that this monetary union of Euro is the first monetary union in the history that is not backed with any sovereign state with cash in fiscal authority or by commodity. You don't need to have fiscal federalization if you have commodity, pr uh, commodity <coughs> priced money because commodity makes countries control their money printed. On the other hand, if you have uh, no commodity backing the monetary union, you need to have control of fiscal authority at one point. You have neither here, and that is the historic precedent. This was political experience, not economic rationalization of needs and, and chances for prosperity for people of Europe. So that having said, there is a slight problem with disintegration of Euro as a first option. First Gresham's law says that good money is hoarded out if there is a bad money, if people are obligated to use some currency. Problem here, if you make people, let's say Greece, if you make people in Greece, that they are obligated, if you, if you say they are obligated to use new drachma, they already have good currency. They will not go to bad currency. I don't think that there is any possibility without huge infringement of civil rights and great enforcement of, of crude force to make people of Greece or any other country lose euro. Because nobody will go to drachma. They know it's going to de uh, devaluate, they know it's going gonna, it's gonna to inflate, so they will not go to drachma. How you can manage that? I don't know, but I think it's not possible. The second argument is, and we'll just skip through all these arguments and then we can go later in questions and answers if, you, if you're more interested. Second one is default can be postponed with printing money for some more time. I completely agree something has to be done. I completely agree that this problem has to be fixed. But I must say you probably completely agree that nobody is ready politically to do it right now. It's much easier to print money and bail out bonds in ECB. So some time can be bought, and it will be. And this is politically much easier. The last thing that many people don't think about is Germany doesn't have economic interest in other countries leaving Euro. Because what will happen if other countries leave Euro? Germany, with new Deutschmark or new Northern European Euro, will sustain great relative appreciation of currency. For export-driven economic growth, that is a disaster. So, Economically, in short term, Germany and countries around Germany would sustain a harsh recession if there is a breakdown of, of European Union. And the last thing, the disintegration of European Euro Union without the default of Greece and other big countries has no economic use because debt is still in euros. If you go to drachma, you have still indebtedness problem, so you have to default. If you lose your comparative advantage as Germany for exports, and yet your banks lose their assets because uh, periphery countries defaulted, you have severe recession. 
it will come. It has to come. This thing has to break down. But politically, nobody's ready to willingly do that right now and I believe in the next five years. Thank you, Paolo. Conference. It gives you some privileges. One of them is to ask questions first. So I'll use it in excess. Uh, Mr. Kerr, I'm really interested in your, let's say, example of the Royal Bank of Scotland. What have or what haven't they done in order to improve their state? And the other question is uh, what about the, let's say, fraudulent incentives in the banking sector? If the state is, is, has insured the uh, bank de all the bank deposits, why should bankers actually think about the risk? Because if they go in the red, the state will, uh, will bail them out. Very good questions. Um, Royal Bank of Scotland continues to mislead all politicians and scrutineers that it has somehow turned a corner. They put this presentation out in September and sent it to every member of parliament and everybody else. This, they claim, shows how they're on the road to recovery. <clears throat> Funny that. Ireland said the same thing. Their biggest bank, IBRC, they've been claiming for years they were on the road to recovery, but I'm delighted that Cobden Partners went to Dublin in May 2012 and told the government guys, look, we can do a job for you here, but if you don't want to use us, use yourselves. Put somebody into the bank. And they took that advice, put somebody into IBRC in October 2012, and in March this year, it was announced that IBRC is going to be shut down and liquidated. It's not turning the corner. Bankers always say they're turning the corner. This is slide 35 of 50 pages of toilet paper that Royal Bank of Scotland produced. And here you see the, some numbers here. I draw your attention to the netting benefit and gross mark-to-market columns. So RBS is saying that they've got in the you know, alphabet soup world of derivatives, these, this is this intertwined way banks enter into transactions with each other. Your professors will tell you all about these instruments in the next three years. But RBS says they have exposure of £472 billion. Pounds, okay? The bailout funds were 45, so we're talking 10 and a half times the amount of the taxpayer bailout to this one bank. About a third of UK GDP is their exposure. But then they say, Look at the next column. Netting benefit, 407. Don't worry about it. Everything's fine. Anybody know what netting benefit is? Well, what that means is, let's say that you've written a huge bet, like the whale trade here, with the third national bank of North Vietnam or North Korea. Uh, then you say, we've netted it off. Doesn't matter. Don't worry about it. But hang on. What if that bank defaults? as they always do just when the system is on the point of breakdown, as you saw with subprime mortgages. This bank is hu humongously exposed. Then they carry on saying, we've also got some collateral offset. Well, isn't that great? I was always taught when I was designing my derivatives to always take collateral from the counterparty. In fact, the largest amount of time on any of these transactions, and I can't kind of refer to some stuff I was doing in Sweden in the mid-90s, mortgage-backed securities, Interest rate derivatives and currency swaps are at the heart of all these major transactions. I spent 10 times the time negotiating collateral, collateral as I did finding investors for the bonds. And here, the collateral offset is, what, 8% of the exposure? Not much collateral there. But then you see they do an even further analysis that even the uncollateralized, I'm going to take some of your water, this is, this is we're not going to pass body fluids, but I'm going to take this. The uncollateralized exposure is now analyzed so that all we really need to worry about is a tiny 8 billion amount, they say. 8 billion, that's all we have to worry about. I tell you, this bank is completely broken. And the second point about Royal Bank of Scotland and the incredible stupidity of the scrutineers is, you remember in my talk I spoke about how Cotton Partners had exposed them, falsifying their accounts to the tune of 24 billion, ridden it up, I guess we risked a defamation suit, Royal Bank of Scotland told all the press in the summer of 2011 they were going to really rip us to shreds. Then they decided just to shut up and hope the, point, the problem would go away, as it appears to have done so. But the, the reason that we were so 
easy, easily able to prove the fraud. It wasn't rocket science mathematics by my team at all. It was simply that because Royal Bank of Scotland is the only bank whose bad assets are guaranteed by the government through an insurance scheme, we simply looked at the accounts submitted to Parliament by the government HM Treasurer's own insurance scheme. And that revealed the losses they expected, 57 billion, compared to RBS's number, 32. Allowing for timing, we said 23 billion. Thank you. So um, what happened next? RBS was shocked. They didn't realise that the accounts could so easily be downloaded. I sat in a room in the Parliament with two members of Parliament, three senior guards from RBS, as they tried to, first of all, accuse the MPs of defaming them, and then I just produced the accounts and said, well, that's the number that your own scrutineers are submitting independently. Oh, OK. Then they said, well, everybody else is doing the same thing. Well, that's a good defence, isn't it? And then they tried to make up some story about French banks, Société Générale. All of this is written up in my little book on the website. Well, what they did then, of course, is they then decided that the last thing they wanted was to be in this asset protection scheme. And then they announced in September 2012 they'd, they'd left it. Now, this scheme had £280 billion of bad assets in the summer of 2011. They sold, liquidated, took losses. The numbers were down to £60 billion by September 2012. The reason they left it, they said, and you can look on the internet for this, is the premium of £600 million was too much. Right, I hope you can do the sums here. £600 million insurance premium for a £60 billion book is 1%. I can tell you, as a credit, credit default swaps trader, you couldn't find anybody in the market who would write insurance on the most toxic, unsaleable 60 billion junk that this bank has for less than a premium annually of about 25 to 30%. So having a deal lined up with the UK taxpayer, 1% is the most unimaginably great trade. They didn't have to do anything, just keep paying the premium and the taxpayer pays out 90 cents on the dollar. But they bought themselves out of that transaction. The only reason, Col Inspector Colombo would say, is to prevent people like me pointing out next year's false accounting. The second question about deposit insurance, well, very briefly on that one. State-backed deposit in insurance is wrecking the banking system. As we saw in the UK and Netherlands, Icelandic criminals, for they are criminals, running Glitnir, Kaupthing, Landsbanki, came to, came to London and, and The Hague and everywhere else and offered basically double the rate on deposits with the benefits under European Free Trade Agreement of a taxpayer guarantee, not from Icelandic taxpayers, but from British and Dutch taxpayers. And of course, that simply attracts everybody to the bad bank. And you're absolutely right, Pavel. Bad banking drives, drives out good. Very final point. You seem to imply that my business is a waste of time because we're also trying to redesign currencies for Greece. I assure you, I would like to see these global currencies succeed, but in the mayhem going on right now, I'm advising every government, and I would advise your Serbian government, keep your own currency, harden it. We have all the techniques. We've got some of the greatest brains on the planet. People have done this before. Bulgarian central bankers. We've got Kevin Dow from Sheffield. This is, there's more to this than you say, but I've had enough, so I'll, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Gordon. Mr. Marovic. You mentioned the austerity measures and the rising uh, public debt in, the, in your design. Uh, my whole question is because one of the uh, slogans of this free market roadshow is will austerity measures alone save Europe for this year? But are there any austerity measures? If you look at the data, we see that the austerity is not actually uh, cutting the expenses of the state, but actually not rising them highly enough as probably some of the politicians wanted to. If you look at the Denmark, who in 2012 has a public expenditure of 59.6% of GDP, or if you look at France with 56.6% of GDP, Germany is similar to that, around 45%. All of those countries in 2012 are actually um, spending more than they were spending in 2009. What austerity are we talking about? Okay, I'm, I'm sure that there are uh, at least half a dozen, uh, dozen people who are more of an expert for fiscal policy than I am. Uh, my point was simply whether you were cutting on, on expenditures or, or not rising taxes uh, well enough 
uh, austerity alone is not a solution. Austerity needs to be spread uh, across uh, some lengthier period of time uh, in order to avoid the situation in which dosage killed the patient. But austerity shouldn't be turned into uh, fiscal expansion, uh, especially not in the Mediterranean, uh, for several reasons. Uh, some people were mentioning um, injections from EU structural funds, but in terms of uh, infrastructure investment, uh, countries like Greece and Spain uh, have been investing 3% of their GDP, which is more than Germany and France and, and other countries have been investing. And quite frankly, the uh, efficiency and effectiveness, therefore, of, of those uh, investment, the amount of investment is not um, uh, directly correlated with the quality of, of, of those uh, investments being made always. So before if we can't expect any of that to, to yield results before we deal with corruption and other things in, in the Mediterranean. And to, in the end of the day, they have pretty, uh, pretty uh, nicely developed infrastructure in, in, the, in the last 10 years or so. Uh, Germany could do some infrastructure investment and some uh, fiscal expansion in, in that respect, and that would help uh, both Germany, uh, some of their autobahns are very congested, uh, etc. But there's no currently political will for, for, for such an undertaking, and that would humbly contribute to the much needed fiscal uh, internal uh, uh, rebalancing uh, in terms of uh, north, south, or Eurozone's core to the periphery. The, the second reason is. Uh, uh, that uh, you need to have cert a certain amount of austerity when you're indebted uh, in a currency which is not your own in a way that you, you cannot control its printing. Uh, so, so, yes, the euro uh, uh, led us into a situation in which much of the Mediterranean has been stripped effectively to the level of small open emerging country uh, with, with, you know, some sort of original sin. Thank you, Mr. Lovitch. Well, Palek, uh, you referred to the Gresham Law. Uh, what do you think about the history of the Gresham Law in Yugoslavia? It's in the 90s. We had the same situation, but yet again, we had the complete reversal of the Gresham Law. So, uh, could you actually maybe make some of the comments on that because for the prior audience and what are the parallels of the Serbian slash Yugoslavian case with the possible Greek one? Well, the first important rule for Gresham law to function is that people have to be made obligated to use particular currency that is devaluated. If there is a competition between currencies and 2000 history of currencies in Europe say this firmly. If you have competition with, between currencies, the more sustainable one, the more stable one always wins. And that is rule older than capitalism. The problem with 993 as an example is that people were obligated, but system was so much collapsing and the government itself deteriorated the rules of the system that even though people were not, obli uh, were not uh, able legally to use Deutschmarks on transactions, they really did. And as soon as they started using it, Deutschmarks were the currency. The same thing happens right now in Serbia, and that is one of the reasons why I think we should patch our um, exchange rate to the euro, is that we have double currency system in Serbia. We use euros for everyday transactions. If we don't use it physically, we account in euros. Some things we pay in euros. If you want to buy a car, if you want to buy a computer, um, or anything that is uh, more technical from imports or something like that, you use euros for our accounts. Every single uh, serious company in Serbia doesn't have their personal books. So, so why pay? Well, what's your, why should you pay to the euro? Because 
uh, flexible exchange rate has no good use in Serbia. As it doesn't gain any competitiveness in the Serbian economy because it's one for one. If you have competition between currencies and you have a currency that you can go run to, once you develop your currency, everybody runs to euro. And since everybody runs to euro, everybody accounts in euros. And if everybody accounts in euros, every devaluation is within six months, one for one, and all the empirical studies uh, firmly agree with that. One for one, within six months, every devaluation is transferred to the to uh, every devaluation is transferred to the inflation okay, okay. and, and but, the but, but, but then, the, then the heads of the euro and the Japanese yen and the dollar are doing exactly the same thing that you're criticizing Serbia for doing. They're just outpacing each other in this game of debasing their own currencies. It's a race to the bottom. So you Indeed. think Serbia should join that? No. I think that Serbia should give up trying to outbeat them in printing money because we are printing much more than any of these countries relative to our because no, money it's here, when it's um, European Central Bank printing much more money than Serbia relative to its, its size. But the difference is that once Serbian government prints money and uh, monetizes its debt, it goes straight to direct spending. In Europe, it went to the balance sheets of banks. It didn't that much go to only a deficit, but here, everything that is printed and all the money in dinners that is pumped in, into economy straightforward goes to public sector. Public sector controls the level of spending in the whole country. So therefore, trying to use exchange rate in Serbia to gain competitiveness, it's absolutely ludicrous. Keep your own currency, wait for the fall down of euro, and then figure out which currency will Germany go and then patch to that currency. Because we cannot sustain independent monetary policy in Serbia because there is no um, economic gain from that. You could if you hardened your currency. That's exactly what I'm trying to advise governments to do. Yes, but the only problem is that we have a history of two hyperinflations in less than 25 years and the greatest inflation in whole Europe. So you're asking people who have the greatest yearly average inflation in past 60 years in the whole world to have independent monetary uh, rulers that will har harden the currency. Who will harden the currency if those people have the greatest inflation in the whole history of, of the world? I don't disagree with you pegging to the euro for now, yeah. but, but your reason for, that you've explained doesn't add up. Your distinction between your public debt being the recipient of this printing and in Europe, the banks, you imply as if it's a good thing to give money to banks. Goodness me, why print money and give it to these criminals? No, 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 I'm not saying that that's good. I'm saying that's reality. I'm not saying that fiscal federalization, that uh, moving towards bailout of banks is a good thing. It's a bad thing. It's moral hazard to the extremely high extent. And I completely agree with your analysis. I just see the reality in the next three to five years. I, I would really like for your business <coughs> stay around because we will need it. I'm just hoping you will stay around long enough because I'm not sure that the breakdown will come in the next three to five years. Uh, if I may pick up just for one mm -hmm. sentence. Uh, uh, the, the advocates of the fixed exchange re regime in Serbia remind me of doctors who put a patient on a medication, on a certain antibiotic, but don't realize that something else is wrong with that patient and this, that, that some other medications should be deployed. And since those other medications aren't deployed, a uh, patient is not getting better, so they decide to take him off the first medication, which was finishing part of the problem, settling part of the problem, uh, in order to to achieve a good result. So I, I, I think there's a little bit more than that in, in the whole story and that we shouldn't give up uh, flexible exchange rate all that easily, but that's, that's really a matter for, for another debate which is, which is going off the track. Thank you for this lively debate. I think we'll continue it later at least. So I just open the floor for the, any questions that may arise. Question for Mr. Bonker. Uh, I agree with your vision of the state of the banks in the European Union. Uh, 
could you possibly recommend uh, if someone had to keep money in the bank, where would it be? Well, I, I'm so appalled at the money printing that's going on amongst all the major central banks. No, 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 I'm not asking uh, what currency. I don't know, which, ba which bank? Which bank? Which bank to put it in? To be honest, I would be inclined to, to keep some money in gold, this kind of gold money stuff you can buy, physical gold and just pay storage fees on the website, jamesturtsgoldmoney.com. He's been doing it for 12 years. I have no financial interest in promoting it, but I think it's honest. And in the UK, I think I'd be inclined to use HSBC. I just, you know, I, the, the, uh, and smaller banks diversify. But you know, we've got a government guarantee, state back deposit insurance is silly, but I don't really care about it. I'd put it with Icelandic criminals if they give me a high deposit rate. Any other questions? And please, uh, while posing the question, please, prior to that, um, tell, uh, present yourself and tell us which organization slash faculty are you presenting. Yeah, that's fine. Yes. Uh, so, how big our chance to do that? And do we? I, I'm not sure that we really have a market that European economic space would be ready to. Do. All things by actually reading accounts. Goodness me! I said in the European Parliament, for you accountants, there is no nit too small to pick, exactly. no big picture too large to miss. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I was thinking of asking one question, but then it was answered prior to my question. But right now I want to address one more thing that is, uh, I'm biased over this topic. But I must say, the future of Europe in greater picture that has to be missed. Uh, <laughs> I mean, in, in a greater geopolitical spectrum. I think that Europe, especially the Western Europe, is going on a bad road, bad direction, and it's going to decline in following decades relative to other parts of the world. And one question is not even addressed currently because of the banking crisis and in debt crisis, but it's really closely related to both of them, and that's the welfare state crisis. And uh, I'm not saying this as a s opposition to welfare state. I am, I must say that. But I'm saying this as a realist, as a financial analyst, realist, you just see the numbers and realize what's the case. Demographic transition, political reality, loss of entrepreneurial spirit, and the informal institutions that made capitalism work 200, 250 years ago are worse or lost today. And we are on the way of having really, really great problem with future debt. So what we're having right now is nothing compared to the obligations that sovereign countries have towards pensioners in the future, towards the health system, which is just gaining on the expenses every day. And addressing this question, what will happen with the European Union, it's a short-term question, because historians 100 years from now will say, well, that wasn't their greatest problem. The welfare state was. They couldn't finance it. This was just a uh, surface of a problem, a uh, tip of the iceberg, because you see currency crisis because they had a big deficits. But those deficits are 100 times smaller than the debt that every country has obligation to pay in terms of pensions in the next 20 to 30 years. And I said that in November 3rd on one um, conference, and I will say it again. Once someone discovers cure for cancer, there will be mass suicide from Ministry of Finance all around the world. Uh, maybe just for sh short questions, one or two before we close.
No? Thank you very much. I thank you very much for all the chair speakers here. Stay with us for the rest of the day. <laughs>